So welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I thought we would take this opportunity to have a look at um, rogue trading, some of the three, the, the three main high, pro high profile cases we've seen um, over the last few uh, decades. In fact, uh, I would like to say years, actually, it's been over a long time. I think if we go back to Nick Leeson, that was 25 years ago today. In fact, seems, seems a lot more recent to, to me. Uh, I myself was a graduate at the time. In fact, I was applying to Bearings at the time uh, from university and woke up one morning to read the papers and find out what, it, what had happened. So um, yes, it's, these have been going on for a long time and I think uh, we'd, we'd all agree that the chance of them happening uh, anytime soon is, is as high as ever. Uh, thank you. Right, just a bit of background on myself. Um, prior to joining SCADI, I've worked in the city for 24 years. I started as an, as an analyst and then moved over to the trading side of things. I've worked on both the buy side and the sell side. So both for stockbroking firms, uh, financial institutions like banks, and also on the buy side for hedge funds, et cetera. Uh, and within that remit, uh, I've been both an agency trader, which is trading on behalf of customers to take small amounts of commission and also a proprietary trader, which is taking uh, positions with the firm's capital, looking to make profits. Um, in fact, I set up my own hedge fund about five years ago, um, trading futures based on an algorithm I'd written. So I have acts, I've had uh, knowledge of both sides of the fence uh, from a trading perspective and from a financial perspective. Uh, over my career, most of my trading has been in equities and futures, uh, but I've also traded options, FX, converts, investment trusts, and closed-end funds and ETFs. So just moving on. So we need to start with a definition, rogue trading. What is the definition of rogue trading? Well, as you're all here today and will be aware, it is a specific form of fraud. A rogue trader deliberately conceals their true position and or P&L from the institution that they're working for. And I would bet money that this happens uh, on a daily basis uh, to some degree at most institutions, financial institutions around the world. And when you realize this and you realize that a corrupt individual is part of the story, a, a, a huge part of it, no doubt, um, but you, you, you need to be aware of this. Uh, and in rogue trading, as we like to say, there's an element of nature and nurture. Nature, the individual themselves, and nurture the institution and the framework that they uh, are, are trading in, uh, working in. As we like to put it, nature coupled with nurture. So let's have a look. Uh, we'll, we, we'll, we'll run through these three cases pretty quickly. Um, I'm sure some of you will be aware of what these uh, these guys got up to, but I'll, we'll just have a quick recap of what they they did, and then we can move on to have a look at some of the commonalities that existed between them uh, that uh, will hopefully give us a bit of a roadmap to what we should be on the lookout to try and prevent this sort of fraud going going ahead, going forwards. So if we look at case study one, uh, Nick Leeson, probably the most famous of, of all, certainly in the UK. Um, at bearings. Famously, he sunk bearings. In fact, uh, of the three, he was the one that did the most damage, although his financial loss was in fact the smallest. Um, it was enough to shutter uh, what was at the time Britain's uh, oldest uh, merchant bank. Um, his uh, crime was to be trading, uh, as you'll all see, it, you'll see it in all cases, all of these traders were trading futures mostly, uh, and his desk was supposedly an arbitrage desk. He was looking to be uh, buying contracts uh, in one exchange or one market and selling the equivalent uh, dollar notional dollar amount of contracts on another exchange and just taking the small discrepancy in price between these two to, to earn small profits for the bank. But as it turned out, this wasn't the case. Uh, and what he'd managed to do was um, take massive directional bets uh, on the market by hiding a lot of the trades, uh, famously in account 88888. Uh, that was set up. Um, the, if you read the reports, it's not clear whether he himself set it up or it was set up just as a pure error washing account. Um, but he was uh, very clever in the way that he was able to hide the reporting of this account through to his superiors in London and able to take um, take big big bets within, within this account. Uh, he was uh, very um, hopeful that the volatil volatility uh, in the Japanese market, which was the one he was trading at the time, was very low at the time. So he was selling option strategies around this to try and take in massive amounts of money at, when markets weren't moving. And actually what undid him was the earthquake in Kobe, which uh, when it struck caused a big sell-off in the market, which 
pushed him longer and longer into his positions and he kept doubling up and doubling up again to attempt to make the money back. And obviously, as we all know, uh, this all unraveled rather spectacularly and the dent that he put in Baring's balance sheet was enough to put them under, even, even though um, the Bank of England attempted to put a rescue package together for them at a, over a frantic weekend in London. It was decided that the losses were just too unknowable and Bearings itself was let, let to go. So famously, it was sold to uh, the Dutch insurer ING for a, for a pound and Leeson himself spent a bit of time in prison and then himself became, he became a minor celebrity really. He appeared on Celebrity Big Brother uh, and bizarrely ended up becoming a manager in Irish football team. Not sure where that fit into the story, but there, there you go. Um, moving to case two, which is Jerome Curviel at Sock Gen. Um, his rogue activity happened between 2005 and 2008. He was also um, arbitraging, looking to, to work on an arbitrage desk. Um, he was on what was called the Delta One desk at Sock Gen. And this was um, supposed to be hedging out positions that Sock Gen uh, had written. Um, they'd written structured products to send their clients called Turbos. And this, the job of this desk was to hedge these positions so that Sock Gen theoretically had minimal risk to market movements uh, uh, as, as market moves, markets moved around the, the positions. Um, in fact, a bit like Leeson, he was, in, he was not arbitraging at all. He was taking huge bets. In fact, this was the largest of the three cases. Uh, the total loss uh, that he racked up for SockGen was nearly $7 billion, which is a phenomenal amount of money if you think about it. I mean, I think SockGen's current market cap is more like is currently something around the $14 billion mark. So if it happened today, that would probably be enough to completely sink that bank. Um, he uh, started small. Um, he was, in fact, his first trade had been a profitable trade uh, way back in 2005. Uh, he had shorted Allianz, the German insurer, uh, during the, Lon the London bombing attacks and made uh, decent money on the trade, I think about 500,000 um, euros, for which he got a pat on the back, even though his desk were theoretically not supposed to be taking positions. Um, it, uh, it, I think that was uh, the, an encouragement for him to carry on and, and carry on trading. Uh, and he built up what was a huge position in the futures market, absolutely humongous. I think by the, the time it unraveled, he had something like a 50 to $60 billion position uh, in, in the futures market in Europe. Um, so he was initially, uh, when the fraud was discovered, he, he was told he would have to repay the full amount of this, the full 4.9 billion euros he would have to repay. So on his highest salary that he had earned during his time at Subgen, which I think was 100,000 uh, euros a year, that would have taken him 49,000 years to repay. Um, he famously went to meet the Pope uh, to, to chat with him and then undertook a pilgrimage back um, walking from Rome to Paris to protest against the tyranny of the markets. And moving on to case three, Quaker Adeboli at UBS. Uh, he worked on what was uh, called the Exchange Traded Fund or ETF desk, uh, which is also an arbitrage type desk, although this desk, unlike the other two, was allowed to have uh, positions on, it, on its books. It had small uh, trading limits, which uh, did allow the, the bank to take small positions based around client flow and client business uh, in the futures and ETFs market. What he was doing though as well, uh, he had uh, inside knowledge of how a lot of the systems worked. Uh, he was taking huge bets and not hedging them out on the other side. So he took, he took uh, bets to the, to the tune of, I think it was up to about $10 billion. Uh, and when it unraveled, he cost UBS just over $2 billion, which was enough to cost uh, the CEO at the time, his job, he spent time in prison and was in, in fact deported to Ghana in November of 2018. So having had a quick brief look at the three uh, miscreants and what they got up to, uh, I think it's useful to have a look at some of the commonalities that existed between what they all did. And what, if you have a look through the quick uh, read through the list here of the 10 uh, factors that we have identified and then throughout this presentation what I'm going to look to do is is move them into each of the buckets either a nature or a nurture bucket so nature being much more what the individual is like what the individual is capable of and nurture is much more pertinent to the the business that they these individuals work in and making sure 
uh, or not making sure, as the case was, um, that they were under control and not able to get away with, with this uh, rogue activity. So moving to ingredient one, corrupt individual. Um, now, if you think about it, there's always going to be bad apples. Unfortunately, uh, that's just a fact of life. Um, uh, HR departments, when they are looking to hire people, will obviously go through a lot of um, process to check people's background and make sure that they haven't been up to uh, done um, anything illegal beforehand. But if people um, maybe get a taste for uh, trading and they, they think they can uh, <clears throat> become beyond anyone's control, they, there's an ego trip involved in it, then suddenly you might find this trading start to spiral out of control. Certainly, if we look at uh, Nick Leeson, um, famously, he was unable, he was, he was banned, in, well, not banned, sorry, he was not allowed to get a UK license because he was found to have unpaid debts and CCJs that were not uh, shown on his application form in the UK. Uh, he was moved over to Singapore and uh, applied for a banking license there and was granted one. Obviously, he had not mentioned on this form at the time uh, that he had had his UK uh, FCA license uh, um, unallowed. Um, Kirby L um, was uh, trading on the junior desk, uh, uh, the junior trader at the Delta One desk. He started his trading in quite small size, um, uh, but I think he was obviously aware that he could take small positions and hide them within the system uh, and get away with it and quite often be rewarded for it. And now let's move on to ingredient two, which is management vacuum. And I just can't stress this enough. I think if you think about uh, the, how, the, how the world is now and what management has do, had to do to just keep business continuity going, uh, if you look at the, the image that I put up, you know, this is the, the classic um, way of working that we've now got all used, uh, used to, working, to work, working with, either on Zoom, Teams or Skype. You know, management can't get together physically as it used to be able to. There's lots of uh, ways that people might be, find to be able to get around uh, and run rings around management because they're sitting at home. Uh, they can refuse to answer the phone. They can, you know, it's not like they're in an office and they can be pulled off the floor to be spoken to in a room. They are individuals sitting in their own pods at home and who really knows what they're getting up to. You know, management were pulled in all directions when lockdown struck, just trying to keep businesses going. And some controls were, were weakened at the time just to make sure that businesses could keep going. Obviously, we are now living in the, the new normal, in inverted commas, and a lot of these controls have hopefully been put back in place, but we really need to make sure that they are um, put back in place. If we look at the three guys uh, that I'm talking about in the presentation, Leeson classically was very good at playing off management between Asia and London, and hoodwinking, uh, hoodwinking both sets of management. Uh, Bearings, if you read the Bank of England report, was a complete management failing really. No one really knew what Leeson was up to. He was able to run rings around his, his London superiors. Um, Kerbiel, if you read the Mission Green, which is the statement provided uh, by Sokgen after the event, uh, and actually there's a, there's a chart in this that shows the positions he was taking compared to when his, uh, his superiors left. So the boss on his desk quit, and within a matter of days, he'd started to ramp up positions by, uh, circumventing some of the systems that he knew how to do. He could he allowed him to put on big positions without anyone uh, being able to detect them. And Adaboli, likewise, there was a management issue there. Um, the exiting London manager continued to be sent reports and the new manager that had taken over was not sent them. So it's, um, you know, each three of these individuals were, individu were cases of management failings within their institutions. But if you think about how, how we have uh, moved in the last, three to four months to, to working from home and the management vacuum that would have existed around that, you've got to think there's got to be concerns around, around that. Uh, moving on to ingredient three, business in transition. As a slight follow on from the, from the previous, um, previous slide, um, you know, the, the new norm is working from home. I mean, you cannot argue that we do not live they haven't lived through the largest business transition the world has ever seen, really. Each of the three individual cases we talk about were transitions uh, within their individual banks. But this is a, a mass change to working practices and people working from home. You know, are they sitting on secure networks? Um, they may be logging into secure accounts into, into banks that they're working at to be able to go about their daily activity. But 
could people hack into their systems and then hack through to their, their banks? I cannot stress enough, business in transition uh, was a red flag for all three of the cases that we've seen. And we definitely live uh, in, in, in different times now uh, uh, and massive, massive business disruption that we've seen. And also think about what's happened to um, some banks would have had staff furloughed. Some, some people might have been doing one job and now they're doing another or maybe having to cover for somebody else. You know, the, a lot of things were put in place when, when lockdown occurred to allow businesses to continue working. And uh, hopefully a lot of these have been unwound and, and, and strict controls have been put back in place. But the chances for rogue, rogue trading in this sort of environment, in my, in my view, have increased massively. Ingredient four is a suppressed account. Now, this is sort of going back to the Leeson and his famous 888 account, which uh, was hidden from management. I think it only, only appeared in one report that was sent to uh, to, to management that was that was buried with above, underneath multiple layers of security that no one ever really checked. Um, Curvial was was he'd come from an operations and a back office uh, background, so he knew how to circumvent a lot of the issues. He, a lot of the bookings of trades he did were to internal counterparties because he knew an internal booking wouldn't wouldn't match up as a risk position on to, on the bank. It would just be seen as an internal switch between two. Um, between two books within the institution. So he was very adept at getting around systems uh, and, and misbooking trades so that he could hide what he was up to. Uh, Adaboli, famously at UBS, um, there was an umbrella account that allegedly a lot of the desk also knew about, which was a sort of rainy day account that they would use as a PL smoothing mechanism, which was completely against um, UBS policy. Uh, they would take uh, good p l days and use those to smooth off bad p l days uh, and this was uh, a big problem and obviously the fact that it was seen as uh, as normal um, within the bank allowed uh, Adaboli to flourish and and carry on with his rogue trading and looking at ingredient five lack of operational challenge uh, this kind of harks back especially if we think about where we sit today um, to uh, a lot of controls being relaxed when we went into lockdown. Um, and if you think about it, how easy it would be um, for people to, to run rings around management to claim not to be able to get to their phone or to be able to not, not, not be able to take a call at the time. I think if you, if you look back at what Leeson was up to, he knew, for instance, when the control staff came over to audit um, the Singapore office, he, he held all his meetings on the Cymax trading floor, which was incredibly not, not noisy and loud. Um, so that most control staff would end up having to leave him there and hopefully catch him later. He knew that they, the control staff had a flight to catch at the end of the week. And as long as he could avoid uh, meeting them throughout that period, that he'd be able to get away with his, with his crimes. And I just think if you think about um, the, 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 how we sit now, the lack of operational challenge that could exist because people aren't in the same building, they aren't in the office, there aren't layers of management that could sit down and, and interrogate traders to find out what's been going on. The, um, the, this is a sort of one of the nurturing uh, points that I'm talking about, whereby banks really have to be on top of what has happened and, and, and be able to put these controls back in place. Uh, liquid instruments. This really goes back to actually the poll I put at the beginning that I think, if I recall correctly, uh, over half of you had picked that the, um, the, the uh, fraud would be more likely to, to take place in liquid futures and FX rather than complex derivatives. And in fact, liquidity is, is, is the friend of a fraudster, really. Uh, if you look at certainly at uh, both UBS and SoftGen, huge futures trading banks, they would be processing billions and billions worth of trade and transactions a day. So the, the chance to be able to hide transactions within this uh, and, and put transactions through that would be seen as, as perfectly normal within the, um, the, the cause of business uh, as long as they were being hedged, which in fact they weren't, uh, that allows fraudsters the opportunity to, to be able to take big positions without being, being uh, caught if they know how to internally circumvent systems to get around systems. If we look at that chart I put up there, that's just looking at the FX market. Uh, there's been an explosion in growth in the FX liquidity in the last 20 years or so. Uh, I think that's saying there 
currently about $6.5 trillion of business goes through, US dollars worth of business goes through on a daily basis in the markets. You think about the amount of money that is flowing through the system that uh, if people are, if, if fraudulent activity is taking place in, in a tiny, minute, minute decimal percentage of this, you could still rack up huge, huge losses and put your financial institutions in, in a lot of trouble. Mandatory time away. I think this is also key in, in, this, uh, in, this, in this day and age. Um, a lot of people have not been taking holiday because they've been at home. They haven't been able to go away. And although it's not a direct um, regulator mandate, I think it is a recommendation from the regulator that people in frontline uh, trading operations, management uh, positions should have at least two consecutive weeks holiday. This is not mandated by the, the regulator, but it is uh, recommended. Uh, a lot of contracts at banks will have the fact that um, people should be able to, should have to take two consecutive weeks um, off at any time. A lot of this was really driven by Leeson, uh, who famously took no time off at all because he, had, he was concerned about his overnight funding. He had to be able to fund his positions on a daily basis to be able to carry on with his crime. And uh, the minute that he was unable to do this, that everything started to unwind for him. But you've got to ask yourself as we, as we sit today, uh, and I've heard speaking to a lot of friends, you know, they haven't, they haven't been taking holiday. People have not been taking holiday because they've been at home. So, the, you know, people can be all on, all on top of what, what, what might be going on uh, if, they, if they're doing any fraudulent activity. So uh, if we look at Curviel, he um, definitely wasn't working a 35 hour week. I think he was on 18 hours a day, uh, trying to juggle accounts, trying to hide uh, his tracks. Um, and uh, when questioned by his bosses, he said after the, the death of his father, he said he needed to throw himself into work to, um, to carry on his, his fraudulent activity. Likewise, Adaboli uh, skipped a funeral because he just could not leave his positions unattended. So this is something that, that um, I know that uh, financial institutions have got a lot better at, but uh, you, you have to enforce people going on holiday. It, if, I think generally it was felt that if someone's away for two weeks, you wouldn't be able to cover your tracks for two weeks. So uh, we need to, need to make sure that this is still going forward. Uh, ingredient eight, now your cutoffs. Uh, as I mentioned before, Leeson, he was uh, very concerned about overnight funding. He would try and make sure that he could um, uh, post any margin requirements that he were needed by the exchange on, on a daily basis so that he could keep the futures positions that he was, he was uh, hiding in, the, in his account running. Um, also, if we look at Curviel, he was adept, uh, having come from an IT and, and back office background at um, switching, uh, positions between uh, uh, switching positions between books and making sure that things were settled uh, th that didn't settle. So he, was put, he would be putting them on long settlement cycles and then looking to cancel them and rebook them before any, any suspicion was aroused. Uh, and Adabali likewise uh, was trading. Uh, a lot of ETFs were on delayed settlement um, and was able to bizarrely trade futures, which would normally trade on a two day, one or two day settlement cycle on an 11 day settlement cycle and buy uh, claiming to his bosses that it, he was he was just building a, a position against a client a client trade. I think a lot of um, a, a lot of this will have gone away. Uh, this is not necessarily such a big issue. A lot of um, settlement has now moved into certainly in the equities world has moved into a two day settlement cycle and uh, and futures world a one or two as as one or two days as well. So any delayed settlement um, tr uh, cycle trades would be flagged. Um, quickly, but it was certainly almost always worth keeping an eye on within a financial institution. Um, and ingredient nine is operational experience. Um, all three of them came from an operational background, either working in the back office, in settlements, or in compliance, uh, in the case of Curviel. Uh, and actually, if you think about where we sit today uh, in, um, in, in the uh, in, in lockdown, people have had to wear different hats to keep businesses going. People have had to maybe cover certain functions that they weren't used to. Maybe they've given, been given access to files that they wouldn't be used to just to be able to keep businesses going. Uh, and the chances uh, of, of fraud occurring when people have access to things that they're not used to or if 
uh, people haven't uh, got people covering them in the usual areas that they would expect to, um, the chances are massively increased uh, of, of fraud. And the final one, ingredient 10, uh, is the producing a fake customer. Uh, obviously, my slightly um, low grade picture is of scissors and a contract note, which was more alluding to what Leeson got up to. A lot of controls and settlements are now obviously done electronically, but Leeson uh, produced a, a false invoice um, to attempt to cover his tracks literally by using a, some, some scissors, some sellotape, and some glue to try and put uh, a fake confirmation together at the end of 1994 to hoodwink his, his London bosses. But all, if you think about where we sit today um, and uh, uh, how people, a lot of traders, for instance, um, are technologists these days. They know how a lot of the systems work. They know how to get into systems. They know about how to book trades, how to rebook trades, what internal counterparties um, they might uh, be able to book against to be able to hide stuff. Um, so producing a fake, fake customer. Uh, is 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 uh, as as unlike is not as likely as it used to be, but still with the technology technological know how that many people have, is still a possibility. And this is just a little addendum uh, that I put in. Uh, obviously, the three people that we have spoken about so far racked up huge losses, multi-billion-dollar losses um, for their firms. This is really just to get people to think about. Uh, the effect that fraud can have on small businesses as well. Uh, this trader, Jonathan Bunn, who in fact uh, worked with me when I was at, at ING, uh, I don't really recall him from the time, but he was working at a stockbroker a few years later um, called Lewis Charles. Uh, they were a pure agency stockbroker looking to just take, uh, to take no positions at all to, to facilitate client business and take commission on the way through. Uh, he'd found a way to hack into the system and started building positions uh, in HSBC shares that he was looking to flip to try and take a profit to then get himself paid a bigger bonus. And this bet for himself went horribly wrong. Uh, and they, when it was finally discovered, there were 7 million, they, the, the firm was long 7 million shares of HSBC, having thought it had no position, which was around 42 million pounds worth, which they ended up selling and taking a 3 million pound loss which was enough to completely sink the firm. I think 20 people were laid off uh, and it was devastating. You know, the, 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 the fraud, uh, even at this small scale, although, I mean, I would argue three million pounds is an awful lot of money, but uh, compared to some of the other cases we've looked at is, is, is nowhere near as large, but it was, it almost did more damage in effect. Um, it, it put a complete, an entire business, uh, an entire firm out of business. So in summary, uh, the, the two, the, using the two buckets that we mentioned at the beginning, nature and nurture, uh, the, the ones we really need to, to keep an eye on are the nurture buckets, uh, specifically management vacuum and business in transition. I can't stress this enough. You know, but the uh, environment that we find ourselves in today, uh, there has been definitely a, a management vacuum and there, will, and there has been huge transitions in, in businesses across all sectors. Uh, and that throws up opportunities. That really does throw up, up opportunities for people to uh, to go about fraudulent activities. And just to finish, uh, a quick quote I found actually from J.K. Galbraith, which is as relevant today as it was 90 years ago uh, when it was first written, uh, which I'll quickly read. In good times, people are relaxed, trusting, and money is plentiful. But even though money is plentiful, there were always many people who need more. Under these circumstances, the rate of embezzlement grows and the rate of discovery falls off. In depression, all this is reversed. Money is watched with a narrow, suspicious eye. The man who handles it is assumed to be dishonest until he proves himself otherwise. Audits are penetrating and meticulous. And I just think if you think about, we haven't seen any financial uh, um, rogue trading um, scandals at banks recently. But there has been, in fact, you know, even today we've had Wirecard in the press being put into insolvency. That was a two billion euro fraudulent hole that has been enough to sink what was a DAX uh, 30 member, a big 25 billion dollar market cap company has has been put under by fraud. And given the volatility that we've seen in markets, I'm not sure if people have seen, but there's been a uh, an oil trading group in uh, Singapore called Hin Leong Trading. 
that has gone under uh, based off futures trading by uh, uh, it's group, unscrupulous future, futures trading by the CEO. We've racked up $800 million losses, uh, which has put that uh, business under, uh, and all these losses are currently sitting on the on the banks uh, on the banks books and trying to be sorted. Uh, and that is all from me. Thank you very much for listening today.